All right. Does any, do any of you like being told what to do? I don't like being told what to do. Um, there's, there's something about our flesh that reacts when you are instructed or told, especially if you have to change something. If you have a normal uh, practice and then you're told uh, this is a better way to do it, uh, that's fine, I'll do it my own way. There's something inside. I know when our kids were little, um, it was interesting. It didn't take long to realize that original sin kicks in, like right away. Uh, that little baby really only cares about itself. They want a dry diaper. They want to be fed when they want to be fed. And that doesn't change as they get older. I remember one of our uh, boys when he was just really little, uh, one year old, one and a half years old, uh, we have lots of books in our house. And I remember one time saying, <coughs> uh, I, almost, I almost said his name. Anyway, uh, don't touch the books. And he looked at me and he looked at the bookcase. Guess where he went? Right to the bookcase. And he went like this. <laughs> Grabbed a book, pulled it off the shelf. Now, I'm sitting there and there's a part of me that wanted to chuckle. But there's another part of me that was just incensed. I had just told him not to do it. And he went over, you know, daring me to do something. Well, I had to take care of it. Uh, flash forward, and um, I was just learning uh, computers. The church that I was helping out at was uh, had just gotten a couple of, you know, the old Macs, the towers. Okay, my first experience with uh, with computers was these Mac towers. So I'm just learning things. I had not experienced this. And uh, so I'm trying to get it to do what I want it to do. And all of a sudden I see this little box on the screen says user error. Now, I don't know if you remember the cartoons or the little comic strip things that used to, uh, and one I'll never forget is a guy standing with a shotgun pointed at the computer going, what do you mean user error? You know, that, that's how I felt. Until one day, we had this 14 year old kid who would help us out. He knew more about computers than any of us. And uh, so I go in there and I'm trying to do something and I did something wrong. And all of a sudden the screen fills up with a video clip from the Wizard of Oz. What would you do with a brain if you had one? <laughs> I knew who to go after. It had to be that guy. What would you do with a brain if you had one? I have never forgotten that. In fact, I can't see that movie without thinking of that experience back then. Um, Lent is a whole season where God asks the question, what would you do with perfection if you could reach it? You know, we're not perfect. We are sinful. Scripture is clear. None are righteous, no, not one. And as much as we hate that little box saying user error, that's the problem. It is not God's fault. It is always our fault. His word is perfect. His instructions are perfect. We get off track because we don't like being told what to do. And so we try to come up with some other way to do it ourselves. It never works. You might get by for the moment, but eventually it'll catch up with you. As the scripture says, beware, your sin will find you out. And so just like that little box saying user error, the, the little video clip, what would you do with a brain if you had one? There are those times when God must be scratching his head going, I have made things as clear as I can make them. Why do you insist on messing things up? In fact, we're going to talk about that in our message today. When we come to confession, it is tempting at times to say, I really don't have anything to confess. I'm doing pretty good. 
And then that box shows up on your screen and says user error. Um, you will always have something to confess. It may not be a hideous deed like some, but I can guarantee you that user error is on your screen at some place. And the fault is always ours. But the amazing promise of Scripture is that He is righteous, and He is just, and He is loving. The point of Lent is to remind ourselves of how hideous we really are, but how amazingly merciful He is that He sent an antidote to the disease of, of sin, and that is Jesus. So when you come to confession, that's not a horrible thing. That's a wonderful blessing because it opens the door to forgiveness. And so I challenge you, whatever you're bringing to confession is no surprise to God. That's what confession means, to say the obvious or to say again what he already knows. So let's go to the Lord in repentance. Let's bring all of that stuff to the foot of the cross, whether it be attitudes, whether it be actions, whether it be that prideful desire to do things your own way. Whatever it is, let's go to the foot of the cross now. Dear Heavenly Father, we do indeed thank and praise you that we can come to you in brokenness and humility and know that you're not shocked when we confess whatever it is. In fact, there's probably more that we should be confessing, but we don't. And so, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, prompt us to be open and honest, transparent before you right now, bringing all of our flaws to the cross. Lord, we thank you that your word has promised that when we confess our sins, you are indeed faithful and just. You forgive us our sins. You cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Even that little toddler in us that, that demands our own way, that bit of pride that cringes when we're told what to do. Lord, you forgive us. You transform us. You draw us to yourself. We thank you, Lord, in your name. Amen. Amen. The Old Testament lesson is from the second chapter of Jeremiah, beginning at the ninth verse. This is God speaking through the prophet. Therefore, I will still contend with you, declares the Lord, and I will contend with your sons' sons. For cross to the coastlands of Kittim and see, and send to Kedar and observe closely, and see if there has been anything like this. Has a nation changed gods when there were not gods? But my people have exchanged their glory for that which is of no benefit. Be appalled at this, you heavens, and shudder. Be very desolate, declares the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living waters, to carve out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that do not hold water. Here ends the reading. The epistle lesson is from 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, beginning at the first verse. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because the one who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for human lusts, but for the will of God. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of indecent behavior, lusts, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and wanton idolatries. 
In all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them in the same excesses of debauchery, and they slander you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead, that though they are judged in the flesh as people, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. Here ends the reading. Thank you, David. Our gospel lesson for today comes from a familiar passage, <coughs> excuse me, uh, in the book of Matthew, Matthew 16, and I'm going to ask you to rise as I read this this morning. Matthew 16, and we're going to be reading verses 21 through 23. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Here ends our gospel lesson for today. Let's join together as we confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed, as you'll find either in your bulletin or on the screen in front of you. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, saints. Let's continue by praying for our tithes and offerings. Dear Heavenly Father, we do indeed thank and praise you for every good and perfect gift that you give us. We thank you for the privilege of being stewards, managers of each of these gifts. We ask, Lord, that you would direct us, that you would allow us uh, the, the wisdom to handle these resources in a way that would be pleasing to you. And we ask that you would use these tithes and offerings to further your kingdom to your glory and praise. In your name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, thank and praise you for the privilege of being your people. We thank you for the privilege of being able to see you active in our lives. And there may be a part of us, like Moses, that just wants to see you as you are. But Lord, we know that we could never do that. And so help us to be grateful, patient and understanding, to just see the glimpses of your character. Lord, as we look at your word today, may we see you high and lifted up. Lord, that we would be able to stand in confidence moving about our daily business, knowing that you are there with us in all circumstances. In your name, amen. Ash Wednesday was this past Wednesday, the beginning of Lent. Um, we started our Bible study on Thursday night, looking at the holiness of God, which really is an appropriate focus for this season. One of the things that R.C. Sproul drove home in his first video lesson uh, was the idea of the fallenness of humanity. Looking at Isaiah and his uh, vision, seeing God high and lifted up his train, filling the temple, and what, what could he do to fall on his face? I am a sinful man. I'm unclean. It's all we can do. You don't need a lot of instruction, right? You come into the presence of God and boom, you kind of know what to do when you see his eminence and you compare it to your unholiness. He talked about Moses. 
and how uh, Moses at one point, you know, where he says, hey, God, I'd like to see your face. And, and God being patient, uh, Moses, you know you can't do that. But I'll put you in the cleft of the rock here and you can see my backside. You can be, uh, see the re refracted glory. You know, you can't see my face, but maybe just a, a glimmer of my back and how amazing that was. When you come to church, are you expecting to meet God? I hope so. I hope so. Um, one of the things that I found really kind of intriguing coming out of the revivals, uh, the awakening going on down south and now, you know, happening different places, um, is kind of tied to this. There was one gal and, and she works in the newspaper, I think, if I understood the article. But she made an interesting comment. She goes, I really don't understand why all these people are coming down here to Asbury. Because God will meet them where they live. They don't have to come down here. If they're as hungry as we are, God will meet them wherever they are. I found that to be intriguing. Our focus in Lent is very much like that. Whereas Advent is preparation for his coming, Lent is a, an analysis of who we are and what we really deserve, but yet God's mercy is shown in Jesus' death and resurrection. So our messages are actually going to spend some time talking about what we deserve. are going to have more of a Lenten theme. And this first one you might look at and go, okay, I don't like that title right off. Be afraid. Be very afraid. There are some who are going to go, that is really contrary to Scripture. That's heresy. It is not heresy. But you have to understand, there are two sides to this issue. God is very clear. Over and over again, you see the characters of Scripture hearing a message when an angel or uh, an incarnate experience with Christ shows up. The, one of the first things they say is, be not afraid or don't be afraid and so we get the idea that the people of god the obedient ones get a different message that doesn't mean that is the only message of scripture but it is the message spoken to those who are walking with god and are trying to be faithful when the angel shows up, when the messenger shows up, one of the first things they hear, I mean, they say to the recipient is, be not afraid. So my message is not speaking contrary to that. That is a necessary truth of scripture. But what if you're not walking with God? Then be afraid. Be very afraid. Our Old Testament lesson, <clears throat> actually, if you were to look at the book that we get, uh, it had one verse. It was only verse 13. And I thought, we can't do that. So I called Dave and I went, can we, you know, email, I guess, can we please expand on that. This is one of those passages that you really need the rest of it. So what I'm going to share with you today is not contrary to all the times where God says, be not afraid, don't be afraid. But it's the other side of the coin. And this is where we, especially during the season of Lent, need to spend some time and then put a period behind it. Yes, I understand Good Friday and Easter's coming. But we need to take some time and just focus a little bit on what happens if you're not walking with God? <clears throat> if you're wicked and on the wrong side, the opposing side of the Lord, people who received messages from God had a great many things to fear. 
You should, as Gina Davis said appropriately in the 1986 horror movie, The Fly, be afraid, be very afraid. I had to look that up. I thought that was a biblical line. It's not. <clears throat> uh, it didn't come out actually until a movie in 1986. I was a oh, bummer. I would rather have that have a chapter and verse behind it. In fact, that famous line became part of the advertising campaign for the movie. God basically makes that same declaration to his people who had abandoned their own status as the nation of God. Like Esau before them, they had exchanged their divine birthright for a counterfeit. This cancel culture of long ago had forgotten the true God of their past and pursued the fake gods of their neighbors. Why? Because it was the popular and politically correct thing to do. They didn't want to stand out as odd. They wanted to, what, what was the, the line when Saul, before Saul was king? We want to be like our neighbors. We don't want to just line up with God. We want to have our own king. And God went out of his way to warn them what was going to happen. You choose that option and you've got all these things that are going to happen. Now that was way back then. How many kings had come and gone? And they had abandoned God. And chosen the gods of their neighbors because that was the thing to do. God was now their enemy, and they should be afraid, very afraid. We jump in at verse 9. Therefore, I will yet contend with you, declares the Lord, and with your sons' sons I will contend. For cross to the coastlands of Kittim and see, and send to Kedar and observe closely, and see if there has been such a thing as this. Has a nation changed gods when they were not gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this, and shudder, be very desolate. Does this sound like God is just a bit miffed? More than a bit miffed. He's really ticked off. How dare! These people who have seen the amazing works of God choose to play for the other side. Does that make any sense? None at all. And so God's response to their actions of rebellion and choosing the other side It's not just to be afraid. He doesn't say. It's interesting. He doesn't say, you should be really afraid. He uses three words. And we're going to look at each of those because I really think they are not haphazardly chosen. God didn't just pull out his thesaurus and go, let me see, what three words work instead of afraid? There's a reason why he picked all three of these words. The first one is appalled. You should be appalled. Their stomachs should turn at the thought of what they have done. This goes beyond guilt. You know, when you were little and you did something wrong and you knew that there was punishment attached to that disobedience, a lot of times the reaction of, I'm sorry, is not because the person feels bad for doing what they did. It's because they don't want the punishment that's coming. We call that guilt. All right? There is an element of guilt that hits a person when they do something they know they shouldn't have done. Appalled goes beyond guilt. It's that thing that makes you just, your stomach churn. You feel an overwhelming sense of, of uh, uh, dirtiness, filth. I did something I should never have done. How could I even think of doing this? That's what that word appalled means. Not just, oh, I'm caught. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. It's this idea that your stomach churns and you feel this overwhelming dirtiness. That you even thought of it. 
much less do it. So God says, be appalled. But he doesn't stop there. He goes, shudder. The very thought of God's verdict and punishment should surpass emotional concern to physical pain and a fearful tremor. Pain and tremor were two words that when I looked up uh, this, this passage, one of the commentators uh, threw those two words in. Pain and shudder. Interesting. Have you ever cut your finger and your hand just shook? Or you hurt yourself somehow and you just literally shook? I've had that happen where something has gone wrong. I've done something stupid, um, cut myself or whatever, and my hand just shook. Now, some would say, well, okay, the nerves and all that stuff are going on. But there's also a, a reaction, a bodily reaction to the wound. And it's interesting that God says, You're, you should be appalled. You know, when you said to your, your kids when they did something wrong, you should feel ashamed. Appalled goes beyond that. And you should actually shake, shudder because of what you've just done. We were watching a, uh, a mystery one time, a poro. And uh, uh, this lady uh, allowed her jealousy and things to uh, get the better of her, and she knocked out this other person with a sandbag. Her first reaction was to scream and shake because she understood what she had just done. This was an ethical lady, and she did something abhorrent, something she could, would never really consider, but she did because she allowed jealousy to consume her and she smacked this other person with a sandbag and she screamed and shook because she came face to face with an action she thought she would never do. God says, you know, guilt doesn't go far enough. Afraid doesn't go far enough. You should be appalled. You should shudder at what you've just done. And then the last one I think is interesting because these all build on the other. Appalled, shudder, desolate. How often have you felt desolate, empty, like a desert because you've hurt God's heart? Because of sin. Because of something you've done that has crossed the line. We might feel bad for a while, but God says to these people, you have left your God and gone to foreign gods, fake gods. You should shudder, I mean, be appalled, shudder, and feel desolate. Now, what does desolate mean? Absolutely dried up, empty, barren. Why was it so devastating for a woman not to have a child in the Old Testament? Because that barrenness went to the very core of who she was. To not have a child was the height of horror for a woman in a marriage. And when, a, a, when God finally per, would provide a child, that sense of desolation, that sense of emptiness and dryness and barrenness would go away. And God is speaking to these people who really don't understand their sin. They don't understand how terribly they've hurt God, how offended he has been. And he goes, you know what? Uh, afraid doesn't go far enough. Appalled, shudder, desolate. Because that's where sin leaves us. Empty, dry, barren. <clears throat> when uh, Isaiah had his vision of God, he sees the Lord on the throne, high and lift up his train, filling the temple. What is Isaiah's reaction? Verse 5. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined. 
Other versions use these words, silent, destroyed, undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. Did somebody tell him that? No, God didn't say, fall on your face because you're an unclean person. You come from a, a people of unclean lips. No, no instruction was necessary. All that was necessary is that he saw who God was and was honest about it. If that's God and I'm me, I have one option. And that's fall on my face. Woe is me. I am ruined. I am desolate. In that moment, Isaiah went through all of those steps. He was appalled. He shuddered. He felt desolate. He was on his face. And this was a righteous man. But he was honest about who God was and who he was. Notice how each response follows naturally on the heels of the previous response. Being truly appalled or convicted leads to a physical shudder or tremor, leading to an overwhelming sense of emptiness or destruction. The downward spiral of shame is profound and clearly expected by the Lord. God's point being to abandon God and disobey his principles is a desperate and irredeemable or hopeless path to devastation. Now, some of you are looking at your notes going, irredeemable, that's heresy. Not if you're lost. If you are one who's been told you have abandoned God, that is irredeemable. To stay on that side of the fence, there is no hope for you. The world doesn't understand that. We have this idea that if I'm just better than the person over there, I'm going to be ushered into heaven. If my good is better than my bad, I get in. The bottom line is, without Christ, without a relationship with Jesus Christ, I am irredeemable. And my future is hopeless. So, lest you be too quick to point to that word and go, uh, Pastor, that's wrong. Not if you're lost. If you're lost, that is an appropriate word. For those of us that have a relationship with Christ, then no, that word is not right because we have been redeemed. But you have to admit it. You have to admit that you're lost and you need a savior. And that's tough to do for people who don't like being told what to do. User error, forget it. It's the machine. <clears throat> Sadly, this reality is often ignored by the offender and their path remains undaunted. They run forward, not aware of their complete helplessness to a counterfeit answer to their problems. If you look at the next verse, and that's where, you know, in the little book, it kind of jumps into this one. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, waters, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So what does God say is the, the point of their sin? They've abandoned the fountain of living waters. They've abandoned God. Remember the verses we just read before. And they've decided and said to dig their own cisterns. I can do it myself. Which is basically what you see in those other verses that we read. I can do it myself. I don't need God. I will pursue those other gods of which I am one. I like to be on the throne. I like to think I'm able to do anything. And let's face it, out in culture, you, that's, you're told that over and over again. Love yourself. Pursue your goals. Follow your dreams. Follow your heart. You are God, after all. But God goes, no, that's silly. You've chosen other gods and you've decided to dig your own cisterns. And these cisterns are broken. They don't work. 
Uh, the woman at the well. <clears throat> when uh, you read John chapter 4 and you see Jesus passing through uh, the area of Samaria and uh, this lady comes out to draw water. <clears throat> um, Jesus is there and she's surprised. First of all, she's coming at a time of day that you don't have many people at the well. Okay? Now, I'm not going to go into a long lesson here, but here's Jesus. So she's confronted, number one, with company she didn't expect. And then to have a man be there. Men didn't talk to women, especially godly men and ungodly women. All right? And so you had this conflict in so many ways. And uh, Jesus says, give me a drink. Oh, there's all of that going on. And, and then there's this interchange for a while. And, and uh, if you'd have known, Jesus says to her, who you were talking to, I'd have given you water that you could never find anywhere else. I'm paraphrasing, all right? I encourage you to go to John chapter 4 and read the whole thing yourself. She's intrigued. She doesn't just toss his suggestion away. She asks questions and Jesus answers. There's this interchange between the two. She wants to know where she can go to get water that will satisfy, truly satisfy. But the people that Jeremiah is talking to don't even have this good sense to ask questions. They turn their back on the God who has been faithful over and over again and they choose other gods. They dig their own cisterns that can't satisfy. Even if there was enough water to fill them, they would, it would run right out. When we uh, built our home in northern Minnesota, one of the things the septic guy who built the septic uh, area for us, he was ecstatic because we had land that was covered in sand. Hey, this is going to be perfect for a septic system. He brought in some rock and he did some other things, but oh, we never had a problem with our septic system. Because you, sand is a good thing there. But who in their right mind would pass up a fountain of living water and dig a cistern that leaked like sand? Does that make any sense? No, it makes absolutely no sense. But they did. And God had to confront them through his servant, Jeremiah. Sadly, the prophet Jeremiah was addressing a people who not only turned their backs on the promise of living water for their spiritual dehydrated souls, they spent what little energy they had left pursuing failed counterfeits. Pause a second to grasp the, the stupidity and irrationality of that statement. These people forsook the fountain of living water and cut for themselves cisterns, in fact, broken cisterns, that could hold no water. In a place where every drop was critical, God points out the silliness and stupidity of drinking, I mean, of building broken cisterns that hold no water. Now, if you're looking at this as an observer and you see an artesian well over here and you see a broken cistern over here, which one are you going to choose? Somebody. The well. The well. You're going to go over to the artesian well. You're going to build your house near the artesian well. You're going to go. Your, your life is surrounded by, I mean, is, is consumed by the well. The people gave up the well and built cisterns that couldn't even hold water over here. Now, if you look at that picture, you see the insanity of it. It is absolutely stupid. But we have people walking around, they have been walking around for centuries who have forfeited the real God who has made himself as obvious as an artesian well and have chosen gods that could not answer, that could not respond, that could not fulfill the desires of their hearts. We've been studying in 1 Kings 
Elijah's confrontation with Ahab and the prophets of Baal and all that, you would think, in fact, I, you know, um, Elijah made the statement, you need to pick a side. Stop straddling the fence. So you'd think in that moment where the prophets of Baal fail miserably and all it takes is one little prayer from, my, from Elijah and God you know, brings down fire. In that moment, you would think that he would be surrounded by all these people. Their initial reaction was good, but they didn't swarm him. They didn't follow him. They, didn't, they kept following their other gods. The insanity of such a thing goes far beyond laughable. It's the saddest thing imaginable. They're in a spiritual desert dying of thirst with a fountain of water before them and they choose to dig a flawed cistern. This should make them afraid. Very afraid, but it doesn't. God warns them that they should be appalled, shuddering, and desolate, but they aren't. You get a glimpse of the same attitude as Jesus is trying to get his disciples on the same page before Palm Sunday. He's letting them in on a little secret about the events to come, but they can't process such incredible or seemingly horrible plans. They chart a course in the opposite direction, a plan which Jesus soundly corrects. The gospel lesson for today shows this interaction. Jesus is trying to explain to his disciples, hey, I've got to go up to Jerusalem. All these bad things are going to happen. I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be killed. But I'm going to rise on the third day. They couldn't see that rise on the third day. All they heard was all this negative stuff. When Jonah was commanded to go to Nineveh, what did he do? Yes, God, I am on this. He ran the other way, took a boat out there, had to go through all of that being eaten by a, or swallowed by a fish and, and all of that, even after his mission was done and the city of Nineveh was transformed. Did, do we see him applaud? No. He throws a little tantrum. Jesus makes a statement, an interesting statement to his disciples, especially Peter. Peter pulls him aside, verse 22. I'm sorry, Matthew 16, verse 22. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Can you, first of all, that's pretty amazing. Peter rebukes, rebukes Jesus. This guy sometimes really lost his senses. Godly man, I'm all too often like Peter, but... There are times where I, I look at the scriptures and go, really? You are an idiot. You really are. He pulls Jesus aside and he begins to rebuke Jesus. God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. What did Jeremiah have to address? A people whose attitude was not in line with God's. And they needed to be afraid, really afraid. In a sense, Jesus looks at Peter and goes, you are Satan. Now, yes, I understand, does that mean he wasn't a disciple anymore and all of that? What Jesus was identifying was the voice of Satan, the temptation of Satan, the attitude of Satan. And in that moment, Peter needed to be afraid, very afraid, because he was opposing God's will in this whole thing. Pain and suffering, torture, devastation were part of the plan. Why? Because Jesus took on himself all that we deserved. We're the ones who should be without Christ, afraid, very afraid, because all of that was ours. All of that stuff that Jesus was going to have to go through in the days that followed belonged to us or anyone who opposed God. And so for Peter to say, oh no, Lord, you're not going there. You're not going through all that stuff. Let's go the other way. He was in the place of Satan at that moment. To shudder. 
to be appalled, to feel desolate. Can you imagine what Peter would have felt in that moment? He didn't have to be told how to feel. It was clear. The church has worked long and hard to remove fear from the Christian vocabulary. For years, we've taught our members that respect and awe are better in sufficient terms. And you've heard it. I'm sure you've heard the, the sermons, you know, that when you see afraid, that doesn't really mean afraid, you know, be afraid of God. Uh, awe is better. Honor, you know, all those things. I'm sorry, folks. Fear is a good word because it drives us from whatever we've been doing that got us into trouble. When I, when I looked at my son that I mentioned earlier, and I said, don't touch the books, and he touched the books, I had to do something. I had to discipline him. In that moment, curiosity should have given way to fear. When he saw dad get up and have to take action, did he ever do that again? At least not to me. He might have done it to Vicky, but <clears throat> he knew in that moment that what he did was wrong. He knew before he did it that what he did was wrong, but the consequence came down. We need to understand that God is not, able, not only able, but he is willing to bring the hammer down on our disobedience. And yes, if we are serving him and we are walking with him, then when we see those words fear, we don't have to be afraid like the unbeliever. Then awe and honor are okay words. But we should never lose the understanding that he is able and willing to punish that he is able and willing to bring devastation when that is necessary. So I hope, saints, during this time of Lent, we are able to look at the sacrifice of Jesus, yes. But we should also understand that apart from Jesus, we should be appalled and we should shudder and we should feel desolate. And it's only because of the mercy of God in Christ that we don't have to feel those things. But it's good to let that sink in every once in a while. That there but by the grace of God go I. God still reserves the right to use the old terminology as written. And he wants us to understand that we should be afraid, be very afraid. If we dare abandon the king, the true king, for our human counterfeits. For the day will come when those who oppose God will face more than military shock and awe. When that day comes, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth. And I'm sorry, folks, even though that scripture says that the wicked and the righteous will all encounter Jesus as he is, it's going to be too late. If you're not on God's side, it's going to be too late. And awe will be fear for those who don't know God in that moment. Another reason why we need to draw them to Christ now. So they won't be confronted with that one day. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do indeed thank and praise you that we don't need to be bound up in the kind of fear that the loss experience. Lord, we thank you that we can look upon you with a sense of awe and honor and respect. And we can hear those words, be not afraid, but only because we stand in the shadow of Christ. We are cloaked in his righteousness. For those who don't know you, it is right for them to be afraid, to be very afraid and convicted. Lord, may we use our opportunities as we work with people and family members and neighbors, help them understand 
that yes, God's uh, discipline is there in their current state, but he loves them so desperately that he desires to forgive them. And that applies to us as well. In your name, amen. Amen.